They call it East L.A. These streets are ruled by two masters in the underworld. The eastern part of Los Angeles County. The milieu of the San Gabriel Valley is a little bit different than most places. We have Hispanic street gangs, we have motorcycle clubs. There's a variety of, you know, criminal enterprises that are seeking to capitalize on whatever is available. Drugs, guns, women, all the things that you associate with gang crime. This is where Ruben Cavazos came from. At a very early age, he was part of a street gang, and he has this desire to belong to something greater than himself. He was an Avenues gang member, and he felt like, you know, that was the life for him. As a teenager, he was charged with armed robbery and spent time in juvenile hall. He had a history of criminal activities, and then decides that he's going to become a member of the Mongols. Which is unusual to begin with. OK, here you have a guy from a Mexican Sureño gang who jumps out of his gang and goes to the Mongols' motorcycle gang. Doc's neighborhood was also the birthplace of the Mongols. The Mongols were uh, formed in 1969. The uh, first chapter was formed in Montebello. A group of Vietnam veterans had this desire and love of motorcycles, and they started to form a group. But many of them were Hispanic, and uh, they were not allowed at that time in the Hells Angels. And as uh, sort of a spit in the face uh, to Hells Angels, uh, they started their own club. Early on, the Hells Angels claimed the whole state of California and wrote California along the bottom rocker, claiming the entire state as their own uh, territory. Well, the Mongols took exception to this, and they were a three-piece patch with California uh, as a bottom rocker. This was not tolerated by the Hells Angels, and uh, the war began. In 1998, the federal government decided to go after the Mongols by infiltrating them with one of their own. Bill Queen, the undercover agent, was actually a full patch member for two years and two months. That's the longest that an undercover agent's actually been an, a, a full patch member. The San Fernando Valley chapter was weak at that time, and they were trying to build to keep, to keep their ranks back up. So I think he became Secretary Wright, and so you, now you're handing the books over to him right from the get-go. So it was the best thing that ever happened as far as the ATF. Queen's operation devastated the Mongols. By the time Doc arrived, the Mongols were a shadow of their fierce reputation. Doc rose rapidly because he was a good recruiter for the club. He recruits new talent by just opening up the doors. He just replenished them by bringing in members that didn't ride motorcycles, were gang members, and uh, they were easy to control. With new blood, the Mongols went to work against their fiercest rival. Well, the main enemy to the Mongols has always been the Hells Angels. It always will be. I think Doc saw an opportunity, and he knew that he needed soldiers. What better thing to go after than gang members? They're already violent. What he wanted to do is use the Mexican mafia to start controlling drug trafficking, to control you know, certain uh, geographic areas. Doc's bid to build a criminal empire backfired from the very start. January 2004, a group of Mongols allegedly made a crystal methamphetamine purchase from members of a street gang named Bassett Grande from La Puente, a town 20 miles east of LA. The street gang members recognized one of the Mongols, who was a former 18th Street gang member, who was wanted by the Mexican mafia. He was on the green light hit list. So any Sureño who saw him was green-lighted to kill him. And the Bassett Grande members are saying, hey, what is he doing hanging around with you Mongols? The Mongols in question wound up in the morgue by night's end. Two of the Mongols run. 
one Mongol stays and fights to protect his brother, okay? And he's horribly injured. So this divided uh, allegiance has created uh, this fight. A lot of these Mongols were ex-gang members. They're like, no, I'm not in that gang anymore. I can do what I want. And that wasn't flying with the Mexican Mafia. If you cross the Mexican Mafia, the penalty is death. Doc continued to expand the club. He continued to recruit new members. So infiltrating the Mongols Motorcycle Club was easy because the Mongols were looking for new members. If the feds want to get in on you, they're going to get in on you. You can't stop that. In a way, Doc Cavazos made it easy for the ATF. The biggest mistake he made was bringing a bunch of ATF guys into the, the Mongols and patching them. Seven agents became full-fledged members. Doc put employees of the ATF in decision-making um, positions within the club. There were at least six paid confidential informants in the undercover investigation. Doc Cavazos was also making himself a very easy target. Doc wanted to be a famous person. He behaved provocatively. He sought publicity for himself. He wrote a book published in June 2008. Honor Few, Fear None was loaded with details that would help the federal government make its case against the Mongols. Doc, rather than being concerned with uh, being a good president and being a good club brother, became infatuated with the Doc Cavazzo story. October 8th, 2008. A lone Mongol is gunned down on a Los Angeles freeway. Within hours, LAPD arrests 19 members of a local street gang with ties to the Mexican Mafia. The bridge that the Mongol warlord tried to build between his two underworlds had led to ruin. Police believe Mongols were being targeted by the Mexican Mafia for encroaching on their territory and their soldiers. It forced the government to say, okay, that's it. We're going to uh, go and raid all these locations and arrest members of the Mongols Motorcycle Club. The Mongol Motorcycle Club was in full display, but with no members. They brought in, you know, tons of guns, tons of motorcycles, uh, and tons of paperwork showing this alleged criminal conspiracy that they believed Doc was heading. As I understand it, he began to talk almost immediately. And immediately, they started negotiating a deal. And Doc began cooperating. So yeah, he turned, he's a rat. Yeah, he ratted from the first day. Unfortunately, I didn't catch on until it was too late. He had everybody buffaloed. You know, he never, <laughs> he never even rode a motorcycle half the time because I think he was really scared of motorcycle. It's ridiculous. We arrested and convicted three different sets of national officers numerous chapter presidents and everybody from top to bottom that that you know that was involved in criminal activity it basically impacted the whole entire organization 160 search warrants were executed over six states 81 people were arrested i believe that 78 of them pled guilty to racketeering because they were offered advantageous plea deals um, if they plead guilty to racketeering. In this regard, Doc Cavazos was no exception. He was one of the first to plead guilty, admitting that he led a continuing criminal enterprise engaged in murder, torture, and narcotics trafficking. Nearly two years after his arrest and his decision to inform on his brothers, Doc Cavazos was sentenced to 14 years in prison. He could have been sent away for life. But I will bet money we'll hear from Doc again. He, he has that gangster in him that I'm, I'm afraid the fast buck and the power uh, is going to create a, another situation where he's going to be in trouble again. He's scheduled to return to the streets in the year 2025.